gonna try coming down here. Graham, is it okay if I use your music stand? I've uh, had the privilege of preaching in other parts of the world. And um, Africa was an exciting adventure with the translator. That was where I experienced uh, the spiritual gift of interpretation. But that's a story for another day. Uh, I've also had the privilege of preaching in Cuba. And when we were in Cuba, there were house churches. That's where the church kind of gathers at homes. And they would have services every day of the week. And people would climb in the windows. They'd be literally sitting in the windows, longing to hear the word. And as I'm kind of looking up and in the back, I'm like, holy cow, it's like we're in Cuba. Only it's way older here. But uh, it's good to be together as the body of Christ, uh, gathering around in this place. Christmas is coming. It is. You can't stop it. It's coming. What do you love about Christmas? What are some things that you're like, oh, this is what I love about Christmas? Joy. Joy. Someone said joy. Someone said family. Said, yeah, what else? Music. Yeah. The lights. Who said the lights? That's high on my list, too. I love the lights. Food. Food. Oh, now I'm hungry for a turkey and beer boy sandwich. Not like Christmas candy. Yeah, what else? Worship. Everybody acting the way they should act all year long. Yeah. Celebrating. Yeah. The star on the tree. Expectation. Expectation. The expectation, waiting in expectation. Salvation, I heard from the voice in the back. Yeah, what else? What do you love about Christmas? Best birthday ever, the movies. If you had to pick a movie, what would it be? It's a wonderful course. It's a wonderful life. I was thinking like on the Grinch School Christmas. <laughs> Christmas story, you'll shoot your eye out. I mean, home alone. It's a wonderful, we could probably go on and on with favorite movies. That might be a sermon uh, in and of itself. Christmas, uh, this season, evokes all types of thoughts. For some, it's filled with joy and anticipation and expectation and celebration. Others, sometimes, it's not quite so, but. Some things that kind of spark my memory are the, the lights. I love the lights. We travel around and try to find good Christmas lights on homes, and yet our house doesn't have any exterior lights on, so we find my house <laughs> looking for lights. Uh, I love the, the food and the gatherings of people. I love, like, Kurt, like you said, that people are a little bit friendlier, it seems like. Why don't we act like that the other 330 days of the year? I don't know. Yeah, and uh, I love the gathering <coughs> with my people, my tribe. Some of you are gathered with your tribes today, right? Your little family groups. I also love the fact that we come together as the family. And for some, maybe even for some of you, this is your family group. This is your tribe. And I want you to know that you're not alone in that. I also love Hallmark movies. Okay, I know I probably owe somebody a man card. <laughs> but, but, they're predictable. You kind of know what you're going to get every time. And there's always one quotable line. Last year for Christmas, somebody got me a, this is my Hallmark wearing sweatshirt. <laughs> or Hallmark watching sweatshirt. And the immediate thing they haven't known to go to Hallmark watching parties. But there's always a quotable line. Last night, last night is, uh, I was the last one up in the house. I couldn't have watched anything, but I watched uh, the Hallmark movie. And at the end of the movie, this is the quotable line. It says, Dad, I didn't need to be taught. I needed to be loved. 
And I know for some, that statement's true. I grew up in a family where I was loved and taught. So I don't know what some of you have navigated and the difficulties and the tension that you've navigated. But I can tell you that your story is, is unique to you, but you're not alone in your story. I can also tell you that your past does not have to define the future, and that you're one moment away from changing the generations to come. Before we dive into what Advent is, I'd like you to pray for me this morning. Holy God, thank you for being gracious to us, for equipping us for this moment in time, for being mindful of us. Lord, I ask that the meditations of my mind and the, the thoughts that have been gathered, Lord, that my heart would overflow and that you would be glorified. Lord, I pray that whether through or in spite of me, you might minister to a people gathered here today. They might know that God loves them. And so do we. Which is that you might receive the honor. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Advent is the, the kickoff to the church calendar. So if you were journeying with us last year, we did the lectionary for a year and experienced kind of the liturgical movement of the church. That's not unique to United Methodist, by the way. That's unique to several different church groups. But uh, Advent's kind of the beginning of the church year. It's, someone said it earlier, it's the season of expectation. It's actually anticipation. Advent literally means to anticipate someone or something big that's going to happen. We're not looking for Christmas. We're actually looking for the second coming of the Christ. Because we live in a world in this state of already and not yet. Jesus has already come. Jesus has already given us the power over sin and death, but he has not yet returned. Right? As the Creed said in the beginning of our service, it says that he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty until he comes again. Advent in this season kickoff is to remind us that moment is coming. Jesus is coming back. And you can take that to the bank. Over the next four weeks, we're going to look at the roots. How did we get to this moment in time? Who were the people and the places and the stories that impacted the journey of Christ and your journey and my journey to get here? And then we're also going to look at what are we going to do with that once we recognize and receive it? We're going to be looking at, like I said, Jesus' family and my family. I wonder, does anybody do genealogies? Okay, now, now you're starting to be like, okay, I don't have to be the first one. There's at least two of you. You know, one of the things I wish our, our, our genealogy stuff could tell us is who in that lineup was faithful to God. Because it doesn't tell you that, right? It tells you genetically who you're related to. But it doesn't tell you their faith story. you got to have a personal conversation with people to experience that, don't you? Now, we all receive things from our parents. Good, bad, and ugly. Well, not everybody gets that way, I guess. But we all get the stuff, right? I want to uh, share an invitation from uh, one of our CBIT resources we're using. It says, the invitation is as simple as it is comprehensive this Advent season. It's not an invitation to commit your life to some sort of cause or something extra to do, but the invitation for you, from me, and from others on this journey is to seek Jesus in tangible ways. To reset for a moment. And in doing so, to wake up to the life you always hoped And also to wake up to the reason that you were here on earth. 
God created you with a purpose. And you're all searching for answers. We don't have to get into the psychology of that, but you're all looking for fulfillment. We all are. That's the beauty of life. The gift of God is that fulfillment is found only in Jesus. This is an invitation. Not a coercion. Not a forcing to. But an invitation to follow Jesus. If I can give a disclaimer, please don't let the failings of his followers deter you from following him. Don't let the failings of people in your life and the church who have let you down deter you from following the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. It begins with following Christ. I read this and I wanted to share this with you from Dan Wilt. It says, in case you are unaware, Jesus was born in the first century into a poor family from Nazareth, a small village located in what is modern day Israel. While his birth was associated with extraordinary phenomena, we know little about his childhood. At approximately 30 years of age, Jesus began a public mission of preaching, teaching, and healing throughout the region known as Galilee. His mission was characterized by miraculous signs and wonders, extravagant care of the poor and the marginalized, and multiple unconventional claims about his own identity and purpose. In short, he claimed to be the incarnate Son of God with the mission and power to save people from sin deliver them from death, and bring them into the now and eternal kingdom of God, on earth as it is in heaven. In the spring of his 33rd year, during the Jewish Passover celebration, Jesus was arrested by the religious authorities, put on trial in the middle of the night, and at their urging, sentenced to death by a Roman governor. On the day known to history as Good Friday, Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. On the following Sunday, according to multiple eyewitness accounts, he was physically raised from the dead. He appeared to hundreds of people, taught his disciples, and prepared for what was to come. Forty days after the resurrection, Jesus ascended bodily into the heavens, where according to the Bible, he sits at the right hand of God as the Lord of heaven. Ten days after his ascension, in a gathering of 120 people, on the day of Pentecost, a Jewish day of celebration, something truly extraordinary happened. A loud and powerful wind swept over the people gathered. Pillars of what appeared to be fire descended upon the followers of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the presence and power of God, filled the people, and the church was born. After this, followers of Jesus went forth and began to do the very things Jesus did. Preaching, and teaching, and healing. Planting churches and making disciples all over the world. Today, more than 2,000 years later, the movement has reached you and I. This is the Great Awakening. And it has never stopped. How does the family story of Jesus intersect with your story? Who introduced you, friends, to the Christ? As I was preparing for today, when we look at the prophet Isaiah, I was reminded of a couple of people that were faithful in my life. The story never gets old. The more I tell it, the more nuggets I remember, if that makes sense. On Thanksgiving Day, we gathered, 49 of us. My brother-in-law invited us to share uh, who we were with, because there are six children born of my mother, and each of us stood to share kind of who was there with us. And he said this at the end, he said, you are all here because of this woman, because of who she is. 
Advent and this season of anticipation, you're all gathered here today because of Jesus. And not who he was, but who he is today. Our times of gathering at Thanksgiving will probably slow as time goes on. But our times of gathering as the church will continue until Christ comes again. The prophet Isaiah said this in the 11th chapter. He said, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. The people known as the Israelites heard these words from the prophet Isaiah and they believed it to be true. Any guesses as to how long it took? They were faithful people. 700 years from this prophecy to the birth of the Christ child in a little town known as Bethlehem. Advent is the story of the church. It's your story, it's my story. We're gathered around the protagonist, Jesus. It's all about him. I was reminded of a couple of men, Will Rickman and Jack Tremblay. They were at the church that we were a part of in Hilton, New York. I run into Will Rickman occasionally still. I don't know if he's been... I think he's still alive. He was old when he introduced me to Jesus, and he's really old now. <laughs> he's a big man, and Jack was a bigger man. And these two guys, I couldn't tell you what they said. I don't even recall. I remember going out with each of them at separate occasions during confirmation, and them telling me, essentially, that Jesus is real. And follow him. I couldn't tell you all the words they used. I do know that some of it involved the 22 rifle that was shooting and Jack took me hunting. Right? But I couldn't tell you what exactly they shared outside of Jesus is real. Follow him, Joe. These men were part of my story in the church. Who is it in your life? But I would encourage you to think about who it is that introduced you to the family of God and said, these are my people. My buddy Steve, his wife is from a maple syrup company. And every time we drive through Machias and that kind of area of western New York, and I'm with him, like, these are my people. I'm like, really? They're not really your people. They're your wife's people. He goes, yeah, but not of my people, because her people are my people. This is your family. Right here. And like every family, we got some nuts in there, don't we? You're stuck with me whether you want me or not. Every family needs a cousin Eddie. You got it? Right here, baby. Right? And you might as well embrace it. I'm not going anywhere. You know, even, even Jesus' family had a few cousin Eddies in it. People that maybe were a little bit off. As you read this story, it comes to life. As you read this narrative, you see that God used ordinary people to do extraordinary things. As you read in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, the genealogy of Jesus. So fun fact, as you start to dive into some scripture reading over the next month, as you read the story of Jesus' family history, from his father's side, from Joseph's side, know that Matthew was writing to a primarily Jewish audience and wanted to reveal in his letter that this is the Messiah promised to Abraham. Coming right through that line, we meet a couple of women. I mean, the guys had their own issues, but we meet a couple of women who were outside. Mar, Canaanite, Rahab, 
Marie have known for? She was a prostitute. Cousin Eddie. <laughs> and yet God used Rahab and the faith that he gave her to bring the Messiah into the world. Rahab is the mother of Boaz. Boaz, the kinsman redeemer of a woman named Ruth. People in our family story maybe are outside of what we would normally identify as the ones we want to hang out with. Maybe you're thinking of people in your family right now. God uses all situations for his glory, the scripture says. That which the enemy intends for evil, God uses for good. He uses them to bring God to us. As I was talking to the Lord about preaching today, it took me a little while for this sermon to kind of settle in. Trying to follow an outline together. And finally, the Lord finally kind of hit me. Sometimes I got a, a two by four head, and sometimes I have a six by six head. This was a four by four moment. And it comes in the final nugget of gold of the roots of Jesus. We don't always know where they go or where they came from. But we know that God is always faithful in using them. This Advent season, I want to invite you to be intentional making sure Jesus orders your lives. Your schedules. Are the roots of Jesus permeating the schedule that you have to navigate? Paul said to be very careful of the time that we've been given. For the days are evil. He invited us to reclaim or redeem time, to organize it around Jesus, the risen Christ, and allow him to define our steps. What is the root of your faith? Do you know what it is to have a relationship with the living God? You've heard the story of Jesus. The hope that comes in Christ isn't just about this future glory. The hope that comes in Christ is that we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us right now to resist evil and oppression in whatever form it presents itself. To be the tangible hands and feet of a living God in a world that is void of that at times. You are the church. Are the roots of Jesus permeating your workplaces, your homes, social clubs that you belong to? Would you be proud to bring your brothers and sisters along with you on that journey? Or is this season going to be one where something new is formed and new is shaped? Or a new branch, a new sprout springs up. I was in uh, sales for several years. My buddy said, Joe, you could sell ice to an Eskimo. I don't know about that. He's trying to get me to leave the ministry and go into nursing home <laughs> stuff. I said, I'm not, I'm not leaving until the Lord calls me away. So I said, you're stuck with me. But in sales, you always have someone in your upstream and someone in your downstream, right? Who is it that you're leading this Advent season? I've been reading a book uh, titled Another Gospel. My friend Jan Stoll was the one who turned me on to this reader's club. At first I was like, I don't have time to read this stuff. I couldn't put the book down. Talked about the in the gospel, the truth of the scriptures, the revelation of God in the world, the transformational power of the Holy Spirit. She said this when she had a conversation with a dear friend of hers. She said, Why did you stop following Jesus? Do you believe that what you're doing now is the will of God? Or did you just simply lose the will? Tired. tired 
of taking the higher road. Tired of allowing a good book to orient your life. And I want to just encourage you to not grow weary in well doing, as the scripture says to me. To know that as you fight the good fight, that you will finish the race. And that you too will receive that crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will appoint to you and not only to you. We await that glorious day with anticipation, with expectation, and with participation. As you begin this season of Advent, I want to invite you to personally come to gatherings with anticipation. Come looking for the win, right? How many of you were looking for the win on Thursday with the Bills? I know what he was. We've got two in one week. It's a good day. That pales in comparison to the wind when we realize that Jesus is present with us. Come expectantly. God said that if we seek him with our whole heart, that we will find him. You'll find that in Jeremiah 29. When you seek me with all of your heart, it is there that you will find me. And in the words of John Wesley, God is indeed with us. Emmanuel, God has come. And finally, go this week ready to tell others that Jesus Christ is Lord. For the glory of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we be a people who come ready and leave anticipating. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. God, as we navigate the beginning of this season of anticipation, may we experience the intersection where our story meets your story and it becomes our story together. Lord, I pray for those who are gathered today who don't yet know you. Jesus, that they might have faith today in this moment to repent of their sins and turn to you. That they might experience the love of God which transforms God, for those who are tired, may they find strength for another day. May they find hope in the resurrection and the power of God. And may we be a faithful people. And Lord, for those who are coming, be charged and refreshed and ready for whatever it is that is before us. May we find strength to carry others along on the journey. So that you might be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, as you get ready to leave this space, do so expectantly. In the words of John Wesley, as I shared earlier, best of friends, all friends, God is with us. May the Lord Jesus Christ be before you to lead you, beside you to justify you, behind you to defend you, above you to guide you. May Jesus, the risen Christ, by the power of God's Spirit, be within you, enabling you to go. And let the hell out of your neighbors, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.